Hello everyone and welcome to the 10 a.m. to 11 a.m. session of the 2020 Open Simulator Community Conference. In this session, we are happy to introduce a presentation called Facilitating Content Production and Consumption in 3D Virtual Worlds, Lessons Learned. Our panel host is Ramesh Sharma Ramlal and he's joined by fe fellow panelists John Mela, Sue Caxton, Andrew Hellershanks, Anne Nowak, and Ludovic Lotowa. Ramesh is currently the CEO oh, oh, of Deep CEO Semaphore of LLC, Deep Semaphore an e-learning and e -learning simulation, and solutions, and simulation company. solutions company. John Mela, John Mela, software programming software lead, programming Sue lead Caxton, module Sue Caxton, design, module quality design, control, quality and control, documentation, and documentation. Andrew Hellershank, Andrew Hellershank, back in guru, back in guru, and Noak Education, and Noak Spe Spe Education Spe Spe Specialist, and Ludovic Lotowa, app designer and lead 3D modeling artist. Please check out the website found at conference.opensimulator.org for speaker bios details of sessions and the full schedule of events. The session is being live streamed and recorded, so if you have questions or comments during the session, you may send tweets to at OpenSimCC with the hashtag OSCC20. So welcome again and let's start the session. Over to you Ramesh. Uh, hello everyone. Thanks uh, Olive Tree. The, the name pronunciations were perfect. I love it. Thank you. All right. So uh, for today's talk, um, uh, yeah. So we're going to talk about uh, uh, facilitating facilitating content production and consumption in 3D virtual worlds. Um, the, I will share um, a few of the lessons that we learned, and uh, you know, and. Uh, and then hopefully we'll have interesting questions that we we will try to address. OK, so. Um, um, Olive Tree did a, a, a good introduction of, of everyone on the team, and I just need to uh, highlight, you know, uh, the main roles. Uh, John is our, you know, um, main developer and uh, Sue is always there to uh, keep an eye on us so that we don't, you know, do too many crazy things and keep us in check. And uh, Andrew is uh, the god of the back end stuff. So uh, actually we have our own grade, but we are currently uh, deploying a lot of our stuff on Kitely, uh, mainly because, you know, for operation, and, and marketing reasons. Then we have uh, Annabelle, who is a subject matter ex expert, and we learn a lot from, from you know, from what the subject matter experts need, and uh, she keeps us aligned um, to uh, to to these goals that um, that that teachers face on the ground again, so that we don't you know just fly off and build things on our own. And then Lido is our star uh, 3D modeler and texture artist. And, uh, you know, when we want something to be made in uh, any objects, we just ask for his help. And he will just go and, and let us, um, uh, you know, and, and, and do the design. So I will ask John uh, to... Uh, to do the, 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 the next leg, we thought that we would show a brief video clip just to set the scene because we need like a background that, uh, you know, just to anchor the, the presentation. And uh, John, um, you can uh, launch the, the well, we, we will, I think the best way for us to do it is to type the, the, I will type, I will do this. So let me find the URL of the video and I'm going to paste it in chat so that you get to watch the clip, okay? And uh, once you are done watching it, it's a very small clip, uh, we can actually, um, you know, proceed and continue with with the, the presentation. And John will take over after the video clip. 
Hello, John Mellor here. Today we're going to look at the square rooms app from Rosmella. Behind me, you can see a building made using square rooms. It's assembled from modules, each module being a room or other building section. Here are some examples of modules. Now let's look at creating a building. This is what the app looks like when you drop it onto the ground. A blue box and a small square of concrete. Click the blue box and the Resmela HUD will load. This gives you five buttons. File, Create, Clear, Settings and Finish. We're going to click Create. You can see now that it's given us a list of categories of objects it has in its library. We're interested in the Layout Tools category, so we click that. Now we see a list of layout objects that we can use to get started. Let's click on the 32 meter grid. The HUD changes to show the 32 meter grid's details. Now we can place the grid by clicking on the concrete square. And straight away, a grid appears where we clicked. This will form the base for our building. Now let's create our first room. To do this, we want to back out of the 32 meter grid, which we can do by clicking the back arrow here. This takes us back to the Layout Tools category. If we click the back arrow again, we can see the top level categories of objects. We're going to add a square room to our scene, so we click the square rooms category. This gives us four subcategories, lower, upper, connectors and garden. The lower category has rooms that are suitable for the ground floor of buildings, so that's what we want here. Now we can see seven different types of room. Some have balconies, some have stairs, and there are different numbers of exits or doorways. We're going to use the stairs to exits room, so let's click that. We now get a larger picture of this room. We're ready to create one. To do that, we click anywhere on the grid. And the room appears centered on the clicked point. This is a good time to point out that you can only place objects on either the concrete base, as we did when we placed the grid, or on other objects in the app, as we've done with the room on the grid. In this picture, we can place objects on the grid or on the room, but not on the snow, trees, etc. Those are from another Resmeller app, which at the time of making this video is not yet available for sale. Another thing that's useful to know is what happens when you sign out of the app. You can do that either by clicking the blue button or by selecting Finish from the main menu. Also, if you log out or teleport to another region, you'll be signed out of the app automatically. I'll click Finish here. Watch what happens. The HUD goes away, apart from a small button we'll look at in another video. Also, the grid disappears, since we're no longer making changes to the app and have no use for it. If I sign in again by clicking the blue box on the app base, the grid reappears and so does the HUD. We're ready to make some more changes. Now let's add an upper story room on top of the existing room. We go back into the Create menu, select Square Rooms, then Upper for rooms that are suitable for upper stories. Let's add Stairs, Stairwell to Exits. As you can see from the picture, there's a rectangular hole in the floor of this room, which can connect with the stairway of the ground floor room. Now we could just click anywhere on top of the room we have already and that will place the second room on top. But remember, rooms are placed centred on the point you click. To help us line this room up precisely, 
There is a small target in the middle of the roof of the first room. Let's zoom closer. If we click on the centre of the target, the new room will appear there. And here it is, precisely positioned. However, as you can probably see, it needs to be rotated 90 degrees so that the stairs line up between the two rooms. To do this, first we need to select the room that we want to rotate. To select an object in a Resmela app, you need to long click it, that is, press and hold the left mouse button for a second or two. The room will glow slightly when it's selected, and the menu on the HUD will change to the Selected Object menu. On that menu are various things you can do with the room. In this case we want to rotate it, so we select the Rotate option. Now we're given the choice of the rotation we want to apply. To rotate it 90 degrees clockwise, we can select plus 90 degrees. The stairs now line up precisely. To deselect the room and return to the previous menus, we can use the back arrow on the HUD or simply click the room. Next, let's add a room to the left of the room downstairs, where there's a side door. Again, we want this room to line up accurately, and to help with that, there's a small target. So we select another room from the lower category. No stairs to exits. And place it on the target. And we rotate it minus 90 degrees so that the doorways line up. Now let's go to the Garden category and select Gazebo 1 Exit, clicking the target to place it. Finally, let's add four-sided railings from the same category to finish off our building. All we need now is some furniture. For this we don't need to worry about targets or precision. Just select the object from the HUD and click to place. Rotate if necessary. You can remove unwanted objects by selecting them and selecting Remove. And you can move them around using the various options in the Nudge menu. I hope this has been a useful introduction to square rooms. Please see the description below for more information. And now, goodbye from me and the team at Resmella, and happy building!
this. So after the slide presentation, um, you know, um, I think John can uh, can continue and start talking about the other slides. Yeah, the, I'd just like to touch on the, the inner workings of the system. And uh, we've seen the Square Rooms app, and in the coming months, we'll be seeing more and more diverse apps coming out that use features that we've not seen here. It's, it's a pretty complex system. And naturally, when you get something of this complexity, especially when like this, it's, it's written in LSL um, with the benefits and drawbacks that has, uh, it's, it's necessary to divide it into sections. And I just want to sort of briefly touch on that to give people an idea of what they're actually getting and, and how it works. So this diagram shows on the right there is, is the, the part that we saw on the screen. Um, the, the, the actual user HUD that pops up on the on their viewer. And that communicates with a controller script inside the application itself. And the HUD is actually a very basic um, thing. It, all it does is take textures, the, the, as you can see, there, the, 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 the buttons, file create and so on. It's all on the texture. It takes that, puts it on a prim, and then does a lot of caching to uh, to make sure that you don't see textures loading. Um, so the HUD controller actually decides what's going to go on the HUD, and that is um, independent of the Resmar application itself. Uh, so we could um, we could hook the, the HUD up to other applications if that was necessary at some point in the future. And um, and then the application itself on the left is is what is the, the basic engine of the whole thing, the sort of the, the, the meat of the system, and that communicates with the control to say what the user says, but it does all the resing and everything in itself. And so, if we can get the next slide, let's, let's see what makes up the application. And yes, Phil, it, it, we really have found ourselves up against some limits of OpenSIM here, especially regarding performance and high volumes of data. It's been a, an interesting journey. And and Selby's right. We, you know, you can add objects. I mean, here we see um, the parts of the system. These are all linked together. These are all part of the same object. And at the top, we see something that we didn't see in the video, which is the modules. And these are objects that contain um, the different objects that we that, that are rest in worlds. So, for example, there's one there for the for the square rooms, uh, holding the rooms themselves. There's another for the furniture, and one and the uh, one for the text tools. I said there, and and various other things. And these are actually independent. These could be linked and unlinked and swapped between different apps. Um, and in fact, the two apps that we have on sale at the moment, which is um, Square Rooms and the Mellow Blocks app, share one. They, they both have um, the layout tools. And the idea is that going forward, we can uh, anybody can create these modules. You can, you know, if you if you're, for example, a furniture manufacturer, and you want your furniture to be available to Res Mellow users. You can put it into a module, a bit of configuration, and then release it as a product. And you, you can link it in and you can share it. You can have whatever um, distribution rights you like on it. And it's, it, it's completely independent uh, in, in the sense of being a repository of, of objects. And uh, the, the bottom left there is, is the list of the, the scripts involved, which is these all work together to 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 make everything happen. Um, the, one of the problems is we have is there is an awful lot of code involved here. I mean, the the main engine at the top there itself is is four thousand six hundred lines of code, and we have separated out as much as we can into different scripts. And I won't go into a detail in, for each of those. Um, and all of, all of this is used. I mean, we see there, for example, the environment environment handler, which deals with things like uh, day-night cycles and water levels and things like that, which we, we haven't used in any app that we've released yet. 
And I hope that gives you a, an idea of, of what's inside the thing that you've just seen. And I'll hand you back to Ramesh now. Thank you for listening. Thanks, John. That was just fantastic. A very good summary of, uh, you know, everything that goes uh, into the system. Yeah, what we showed you is just really the tip of the iceberg, really, because we have built into the system a lot of uh, functionalities that take care not only of, of, of facilitating production, but also consumption side where, you know, it, many of these objects can be viewed, uh, the, navigated easily or can be viewed from specific angles through the HUD itself. So you could teleport into any building anytime you want without having to uh, spend, uh, you know, a lot of time finding it, etc. But we have to keep things simple. So I will move to the next slide and come to a very simple example that shows some metrics that would help pin down things very concretely. Okay. So in this example, just imagine that you have a, a subject matter expert, a teacher who wants to set up uh, a museum display, you know, about the recent human endeavor to reach Mars. You know, all of us know there's a lot of activity going in that space, and especially kids are very much interested in that topic. So as a teacher, you say, hey, I've got, let me look at my schedule. Ah, okay. I've got only 10 hours I can spend on this. Okay, this is like the only uh, a big constraint, whatever you do. So you have the choice of spending, you know, uh, a lot of time on creating the museum and all the, the, the stuff that needs to go in it. And, uh, and uh, out of those 10 hours, you, let's say you, you, you can spend nine hours doing that. And the rest of the time, that's all the time left that you have to find all these different pictures and text and information that you want to add to your, you know, uh, to your virtual museum. So one thing to keep in mind, uh, the time available to teachers is very, very constrained. Okay. So our job was to try to make sure that they spend more time on create on, on subject matter content rather than spending time on, on creating the, the virtual learning spaces. So in this example, that we, we will get a, a few snapshots. You know, I created, for example, um, I, 40 images. Uh, that, that's the number of, of, uh, of displays that I had. I had around 50 text blurbs and titles. I have to say that the quality of these, of these images and text is far better than what we are seeing uh, normally in OpenSIM because we did a lot of work to make sure that the re resolution is really good. Uh, the second thing is the number of buildings that I would need. I said, okay, well, for my class, I need only two floors, you know, and then I had uh, a separate app that took care of the landscape around. And, uh, you know, and I just used the same uh, app. We call these apps just to put the seating arrangements. Okay, so if we look at the table, just to summarize what I just said, okay. Um, so you have the first two columns. You have the time to create the environment, that is the environment that's going to, that's going to contain the subject matter content. And the second column is about the time to gather, organize, and import information, and how many hours normally that take. So without our tools, you would take an estimated nine hours to create the environment, and estimated one hour to left to collect all your pictures, text, etc., and organize it in a, in a way that you want. But with the tools, you know, within one hour, even that is an overestimate, okay? I'm just trying to be as generous as I can. You, you create the environment and then you're left with nine hours to find your pictures on the web um, and, and enter the text. Remember, in our case, you don't need to do all the texture, importing, cutting and pasting. We have a workflow that I'm going to blog about and write about so that you find that it's very, it's very quick. You just see a picture, capture it, put the URL in, and bang, you have your, your display and your images and everything, okay. Um, and then we, we thought that we can further, we can further make things still faster, and that's the last row. And how do we make that happen? If as a teacher, you create like a little museum in a way, and you organize the furniture, the displays, the screen, 
in a certain way, you can save this as a template, okay? Um, and this template is just a note card, some, another teacher with the same app, they will just take the template and use it. So now, the even the one hour that you need to create the environment is gone. You don't, now you just need to find your pictures and, and uh, add it to your space. So this is like just a, uh, you know, a few snapshots of that environment and showing you inside. So all the trees outside and the mountain that was created by a landscape app and all these different apps I'm mentioning have this follow the same, you know, principle that John just explained. It's just one application, but each app has a different set of modules and, uh, you know, with both static and interactive content. So I'll just go through the slides, through those different slides here. Um, in, in this picture where you can see the white grids all over the place, all these have snap to grid functionality. So if you want to align your pictures properly, precisely on, on, on a screen, it's very easy. You can just, you know, click your objects and not be very careful about where you click and it's going to position everything automatically very precisely. Um, so that's the one thing and the same thing holds for furnitures and things like that. All these furnitures are scripted, obviously you don't need to fiddle with, with any scripting. Uh, the board at the background is just like a web browser, but it's fully functional. It's got, you, know, you can collect all the bookmarks that you collect actually can appear as objects, like the little books in the rock on the left that you can place and organize. Um, just to give like an overview of, of these different uh, you know, facilities. So one thing I've noticed that when we take the approach of, of looking at the world and breaking it down into smaller parts and then hoping that you can use these smaller parts to reassemble them and in order to create more creative things. You might actually see on the right picture here of the slide that there is a little coffee table. But if, if with a, with someone with a keen eye will find out that all these little, this coffee table is actually made up of other furniture tables that I, I just shrunk and put it here, you know, uh, it took me like maybe 30 seconds to make that furniture table. It's just that how creative you can be in reusing those parts is up to you. And, and it's just think about what are we are offering. It's like we are creating like, you know, you had Word, Word, WordPress, for example, for creating websites and you have people creating, you know, lots of, uh, of, of example templates for websites that they can reuse, but it's similar. I mean, it's similar. We have, uh, we have first facilitated content product production. Secondly, made it easier to navigate and, and see these objects. We didn't have time today to talk about snap to view, snap to, uh, or jump to place, etc. cetera, that we, that, that we presented last year. Um, but uh, you can see how we addressed, you know, both ends of the spectrum, production and consumption. Um, and this is just to give you an example um, of the wide range of buildings that you can create. So someone, anyone using our application, they can create their own scenes and they are free to put it on the market and sell it, you know, and uh, any other person will just buy these note cards and, and reuse it, okay? So uh, for, for the video clips, uh, that the one that John showed, if you look at the channel, there are many other cases, many other description, well, many use cases that we describe. I personally use, for example, the Melablox applications to make my, my main uh, um, presentations. In fact, for my talk tomorrow, that video is already up there and uh, I'm going to talk about the more philosophical underpinnings of, of, of what we are doing here right now. Um, so I think I will, what I'll do here, I'll leave, um, I'll, I'll take a pause here and we'll, we'll, uh, we'll take, you know, uh, like, like feedback and questions, any questions that you have, and we'll try to, uh, uh, to answer them. So while, while you gather your questions, I can describe a little bit about the various kind of modules that we have. We have one modules, for example, for NPCs, 
we have a module for another, uh, you know, types of buildings that 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 is even faster than what you just saw uh, with uh, uh, with uh, what uh, what uh, John just presented. We have a lot of uh, uh, you know more advanced nap to grid that you can uh, you know it's very easy. So if if anyone wants to to create like a big uh, a really large museum, they, they wouldn't even need to look and have high camera skills to find how to adjust things. And it's practically snap to objects. So basically, just imagine, you know, you have these huge Lego blocks that you can assemble very quickly together without having to bother with a lot of the viewer's tools. Um, I'm going to read um, the questions in, in, in the chat as, as they appear. So, so was there any, anything that you want me to explain in terms of productivity gains when, uh, you know, the, for subject matter experts? I imagine there might be a lot of teachers uh, in this space. So uh, I think um, I see John is addressing a lot of the questions already. So there are there are a lot of of, of uh, you know we have our trajectory really um, very uh, very clear to us, and there's a lot of work to be done, especially for creating and adding more modules. And these these tasks tasks don't necessarily involve a lot of they practically practically don't involve any coding at that level. We just need um, you know people who want to uh, maybe sh sell their objects to us so that we can use them to create new modules. Um, we are very much interested in in high quality non-player characters because we have modules that could you know. Pro, uh, that could use them as well, so that somebody could have an app that would allow them to pop out uh, non-clear characters, and these can be moved and placed on on the various, uh, you know, furnitures. You can use that for machinima. You can use that for storytelling. So it's pretty much, you know, a wide range of applications. Um, in fact, for my presentation tomorrow, you'll you'll, you'll actually find in practice how I use. Uh, one of our apps to support my 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 talk, and uh, and really the the challenge here for us is to really try to make a, a space that has that balances both productivity and social functions. I keep saying that because if there is no reason for people to come in a 3D world to do more than just watching a screen and watching text chat, they won't come. And and. Uh, and I think that this is a, an issue that that a lot of designers have faced, and uh, and it's a very crucial one. Okay. So uh, th th there are many reasons why um, you know you have alternative technologies from video conferencing, and uh, you know even uh, other domains uh, which are not really 3D are really thriving in this space. Uh, as far as connecting humans, but for some reason, you know, for for virtual worlds, it's still it's still not there. And I believe that it's important that we spend a lot more time, you know, creating opportunities for people to find a, a reason to go to 3D worlds. And there are only two ways for doing it. One is by providing a space where they can actually do a job better in 3D in the 3D environment than outside. And the second one is um, 
you know, it's uh, it's uh, the social aspects. And even for that one, I guess it's kind of hard because even if you go down the higher fidelity route that many have tried and failed, um, it seems that it's very hard to beat the, the cheapest solutions re regarding emo emotional co connections through simple video conferencing. Okay, so I'm still I'm still having like a a parallel uh, chat here, and uh, I see that there are a lot of of, of uh, people. Oh, let me talk a little bit about uh, the, the, how we connect uh, the virtual world aspects uh, of of actually developing applications for the <coughs> virtual world and. Uh, and the Dev team of OpenSim, you know, uh, the one thing that we hope will happen is that is increase the uh, conversations between application builders and Dev builders because there's a lot of times where where we, you know, if if we want if you uh, a number of things, you know, when we develop full blown applications at that level, inevitably we always hit the the nitty gritty parts of the underlying open sim systems. And uh, and uh, I think that, you know, um, the, 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 what we need at the higher levels, if there's, uh, you know, an easier way for those needs to percolate down so that the developers can help us more, I think that that will really help um, because we are very, very close to the, we have the opportunity to be close to the users and also close to the developers. So we are building that middle layer that we think is missing. Um, if you, I will, I will pause right now because I think I'm going to talk for too long. Um, and if you have any questions for, for the others, uh, please feel free to, uh, to ask them. So one thing that, that you should realize about designing and implementing productivity tools, it's always about speed. And it's always about how much time saving happens, okay? So, uh, so that, that's, that's all our, you know, what we aim for. And, and let me tell you, I am a super builder and I prefer to use my tools only because I save vast amount of time. You know, tomorrow I had my talk for, uh, for, for you know, talking a little bit uh, at the end about why we are doing what we are doing. And I, the first thing I went to, I went to the Millablocks app because that was the, the app that I find as the easiest way for me to capture like a stream of consciousness and build like a new way of presentation. And uh, it's only because of speed. So if, if I were to use my building skills for the viewer, I can tell you I will have spent 10 more times. Uh, I mean, instead of spending, let's say one hour, I would have spent a lot more time just to create the same thing. So, so yes, so that's pretty much, I guess, what I, what I had to, uh, to tell you guys for, for, uh, for this session. So please reach out to us uh, if you have the skills or the time or the resources and, uh, you know, and people who have collaborated with us always end up happy. <laughs> All right. Okay, so I'll go quiet for now. I think I'd, I probably, you know, run out of gas. So thank you, you very any... much. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much, Ramesh, and uh, to uh, the panelists for a terrific session. All right, as, guys. As a reminder to our audience, you can see what's coming up on the conference schedule at conference.opensimulator.org. Following this session, the next session will begin at 11 a.m. in this keynote region and is entitled State of the Open Simulator Community. Also, we encourage you to visit the OSCC 20 Poster Expo in the OSCC Expo 3 region to find accompanying information on presentations. 
and explore the hypergrid tool resources in OSCC Expo 2 region, along with sponsor and crowdfunder booths located throughout of the OSCC Expo regions. So thank you again to our speakers and the audience. Thank you.